right, that's the last of it. All right, we got a lot of work to do. This is Dino 2 at Banks. We've gutted the room, and we're going for the moon in terms of accuracy, capability, repeatability. We're going to bring emissions capability into this dyno cell as well, on engine emissions measurement, so to speak. So this will be cell two. It'll be real capable in terms of torque, horsepower. I'm, I'm going to show you some of this stuff here in a few minutes, but the main thing we were looking for was controllability, repeatability, and accuracy. So we didn't have those with the previous dyno, which was a tailored design that we bought from Superflow years ago. Uh, and we've been using a Superflow control panel and control valving. It doesn't have the repeatability or the accuracy we're really looking for. You know, there's two things that you really want if you're going to have accurate, repeatable data. The first thing is that the days are all the same. And, well, the days are not all the same. So the NASCAR guys, to make the days all the same and have no correction factors, the correction factor uh, actually induces a little bit of error sometimes. So to really get down and find a half a horsepower uh, and be, be able to do that repeatably, you know, it doesn't sound like much, but if all your aero and all your rolling resistance is the same and you're running 500 miles, a half a horsepower could win you the race. I can't spend a half a million dollars on climate controlling my dyno cell. Those, di those NASCAR dyes do stuff like that. Most everybody else, eh, you know, I got 6,000 horsepower, what do I care? Well, we care. Uh, we want to find the miles per gallon. We want to find every little bit in terms of emissions. We want to know exactly where we're at and do it repeatedly all year long. It was time to move up to professional grade. Now, there's hobby level engine dynos and there's intermediate level, uh, big torque, big horsepower, but most of those dynos are like the F24 uh, Froud in our next room over here, which is the basis for a dyno that comes out of uh, uh, India that a lot of guys use, which is a very accurate copy of a Froud F24. But basically, they're all the same. And they're very similar to the one we're putting in here in, in terms of capacity. I'm talking about the absorber. How, how do these guys take 1,000 horsepower dynos and measure 2,500 horsepower, whatever? They do it on a sweep. What we're looking for is running high horsepower. We're doing a new crate engine and marine engine program. And of course, we've got our military engine uh, programs going. They're asking for emissions. Some of the, some of the sales, uh, we're go going into emissions on military engines. We're going into emissions on marine engines. Uh, so we want to know accurately where the hell we're at. And we want the dyno to be able to hold an RPM accurately within a couple of RPM. Guys claim this all day long. We buy, have bought all, all makes of dynos. In my career, there are dynos all around this place, like the rings in a tree, you know, it's my career. We're looking for something that'll run 400 hours or 800 hours at or near wide open throttle. Uh, at full load, 85% of that 800 hours. That's what, the, that's what the Navy has asked me to do. This is going to be that dyno. Accurate, repeatable, and most important, it's going to have a facilities water setup with a cooling tower, uh, which I will show you. It is a mother. We want to be able to run 1,000 or more horsepower continuous, 24 hours a day, not for five or six seconds, 24 hours a day for days. One of the tests we run is 33 days in length. So if this cell looks familiar to you, it's where we've been doing killing a Duramax, and it's why we've paused that program to, to 
upgrade this place. Let me show you the absorber. We kind of did a worldwide search for this dyno setup. And we chose AVL. They're in Austria, uh, founded by Dr. Hans List in 1948 to further diesel technology. So from the very first, although they do everything and diesel today, uh, from the very first, they were a diesel institution. AVL stands for the List Institute for Internal Combustion Engines. These guys today are into everything. Around 1979, Helmut, Hans List's son, took over the company. And to my knowledge, he still runs the company. So this is a long-term family operation. They've been in business 10 years longer than we've been in business. They're developers of engine technology. When you develop engine technology, how do you measure your success? And today, how do you measure the legality, the emissions output of your success? That's where we're sharpening our abilities here at Banks. What does a dyno do? You take an engine, let's take one of these 2020 L5Ps off the rack here, you couple it to a drive shaft, through the drive shaft, and this particular dyno drive shaft has an elastomeric coupling section in here. It kind of decouples the firing spikes from the engine, the torque spikes, such that those torque spikes don't kick the hell out of the dynamometer. And that all happens right in here. So it's a tuned drive shaft. And oh, by the way, it's got some mother universal joints. This drive shaft connects to this device, and that's the dynamometer. That's the absorber. What this does is it converts horsepower into heat. This is a hydraulic dyno. So we're going to move massive amounts of water through this thing and reject huge amounts, like up to 150,000 BTUs of heat per minute. I'll show you how we're going to do that in just, a, in just a second. But basically, the shaft connects right here, and the rotation is clockwise, as is the rotation of the engine. When you face the front of the engine, the crankshaft is rotating clockwise, the dyno re rotates clockwise. Load water, precisely measured, uh, enters the absorber, the roting, rotating element in the absorber reacts against the, the housing of the absorber, and there's a torque arm. The torque arm has a strain gauge that measures the amount of torque being applied to the absorber. Once you know the torque, you can compute the horsepower. So this is the heart of the system right here. This is when, when guys talk about Ah, he's got a thousand horsepower dyno. It's that guy right there that they're talking about. So this absorber has a 7,000 RPM maximum speed, which is just fine for all the diesel stuff we're doing, and a good deal, probably most of the gasoline things we'd want to do here uh, as well. Capacity steady state is 1,033 horsepower, and 1,844 pound-feet of torque. That's steady state. That's day and night for months. But I can still do the 3,000 horsepower or the 3,500 pound-feet of torque just ripping a five-second blast. That's easy. No problem there. It's the steady state you pay the big bucks for. This unit takes the process water from, from your facilities system into this upper tank, and right there it decouples. In other words, it makes its own pressure. So what you have here is a tank with a giant float valve in it. It maintains water level. It supplies this pump, this Grundfos pump. And I love these guys that make these, these pumps. The American headquarters is in Fresno, and I buy pumps from them all the time for other stuff. The hot water circulation pump on my house is a Grundfos. Water, gravity feeds from this reservoir into the pump, out of the pump, actually up through in plumbing that's inside here, out here to the load control. 
facilities water in, load control water out. What's cool about this is that pump is speed controlled by the same software that's controlling everything else here. So the net effect of this is the pressure at the load control valve is always constant. That, that's what this is all about. It has nothing to do, it's totally decoupled from the facility system. So what we've got here is probably the world's most expensive water heater. And how do we dissipate the heat? So this is our Evapco cooling tower. We're building a giant stainless steel tank that will mount at ground level. And it'll be a few thousand gallons. Uh, the hot water will go into one side of it. The cold water will go into the other side of it. So all the hot water from both cells goes through two eight inch pipes into the hot section. And out of the hot section, we pump water at about 400 gallons a minute into this cooling tower. Mounted above that stainless tank, we're building a framework and this Evapco evaporative unit will sit up there forming a cooling tower. This is the outlet duct work, so to speak. This outlet assembly mounts up on the top and gets the hot air further away from the twin squirrel cage blowers that feed air into the bottom of it. So what we've got here is a 20 horsepower 480 volt three phase motor making 41,000 CFM of flow, cooling 400 gallons of water a minute that's pumped up out of the pump cabinet on the bottom of our framework into the tower and then it drains back through another eight inch pipe into the cold section. From the cold section, we pump out into a manifold that feeds intercoolers, jacket water coolers, all the other stuff, including the load water reservoir I just showed you. And that'll be in cell two. Cell number one still has a traditional setup and still has that unstable conditions that we put up with. We've perfected it pretty well. We've driven the guys who write the software nuts, uh, but there's nowhere they can go. Their systems are just a bit primitive. So we feel with AVL, we're gonna move beyond that and we're, we're gonna be at world-class actually. This is about half of what we got to build, but one thing's for sure, this stuff ain't gonna install itself. This is too much, I need a 48 hour day.